This is a work of political and social commentary. The content of this video is not meant for children under the age of 13. Parental discretion is advised. The Democratic field has finally narrowed down. Gone is the enormous field of candidates. We are now down to just three. Joseph Biden, who is setting new lows for strange behavior and stranger statements in a candidate. Bernie Sanders, who is taking on the entire Democratic establishment in yet another bid to win friends and influence people, and Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard is still running? Yep, and the DNC seems to be giving her even more problems than they gave Bernie Sanders. After researching the reasons that the DNC is resisting a candidate who checks yes for membership in nearly every minority group, I've got some thoughts. Grab a cup of coffee and a pastry and sit back because it's time for some Sunday morning roasted opinions. Let's crank back the clock to 2012, shall we? That was when Tulsi first popped up on the national political stage by running for Hawaii's 2nd District. Because she had already done some very good work in the state legislature and on Honolulu's city council, she emerged as an unlikely underdog winner and has represented the 2nd District ever since. Once in Congress, Gabbard quickly established herself as an activist representative. She introduced numerous acts of legislation, most of which Bernie Sanders could have easily written. Nancy Pelosi called her a rising star. In 2013, just one year after her election to Congress, Gabbard was elected unanimously as vice chair of the DNC under Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And that may have been the worst thing to happen to her political career. You see, Gabbard's positions are largely similar to those of Bernie Sanders. Gabbard is also, as far as I can tell, a decent and pragmatic person. She stays in hotels and low-cost accommodations when campaigning to save money, has twice announced that she would not run for re-election to an office which she currently holds in order to prevent a special election if she wins both offices that she's running for, and she is unafraid to take her concerns to the press if the organization she represents is failing to police themselves. Case in point. During the 2016 election cycle, Gabbard raised concerns that the Sanders campaign was being treated unfairly, that the Democratic Party should have no superdelegates, and that super PACs were being used to circumvent the limits on political contributions and therefore interfere with the election process. When Wasserman Schultz refused to correct or even discuss these issues, Gabbard wrote her privately to express her concerns. That letter was part of the DNC documents published by WikiLeaks in 2016. Oh boy. Gabbard resigned her position as vice chair in order to support Bernie Sanders' 2016 campaign. Sanders, as you recall, was up against Hillary Clinton for the nomination. Gabbard didn't like the way that Sanders was being treated by the DNC. And Clinton remembers that Gabbard didn't support her like Donna Brazile and Debbie Wasserman Schultz were doing. That was just one time that Gabbard tangled with the DNC establishment. There were others, like the time that she openly criticized Wasserman Schultz for limiting debates and barring participants in unsanctioned debates from a place on the stage in a sanctioned debate. Clearly, she wasn't making any friends within the core of the DNC establishment. She was catching people's eye, though, especially when she declared her candidacy. When Gabbard was about to announce her campaign, NBC News ran a story that she was being supported by Russian propaganda just two hours before she announced her candidacy. When Gabbard got media coverage, th that coverage was overwhelmingly negative. Not merely negative, Donald Trump level negative. She pledged back in 2017 not to accept PAC money. So her fundraising is much less than candidates who do take such donations. She was also mentioned much less than her polling position suggested. Placing ninth back when the field was big enough to need two debate stages, yet coming in 14th place in the number of times that she was mentioned in the press. She was barred from the debate stage due to low fundraising, and then barred from the stage again due to low polling data, and now she is barred from the stage due to the low number of pledged delegates she has won. That's interesting, because she landed some telling blows against Kamala Harris during one of the debates in which she was allowed to participate. The downturn in the polls which led Harris to drop out was tied to Gabbard's decimation of her record as a prosecutor, and on marijuana. Gabbard missed the third debate, 
but made it into the fourth debate where a pattern had emerged. Leading candidates were getting as much as three times the speaking time as the less popular candidates. By the time of the sixth debate, despite her past success, Gabber was back to not qualifying to appear in the debates. The DNC shifted the goalposts again and again. Even with a pair of pledged delegates, Gabbard still doesn't qualify to participate in the debates. But why? Because Gabbard is the kind of person who calls out the DNC repeatedly on the favoritism during debates. She publicly embarrassed the DNC chair and then endorsed Bernie Sanders against Hillary Clinton. Sanders, by the way, being the candidate who the DNC just doesn't seem to want nominated. Ditto Gabbard, it seems. Now she has taken to Twitter to ask Biden and Sanders to demand fair treatment from the DNC on her behalf and let her on the debate stage. Mind you, Sanders and Biden have no good reason to permit her on the stage as that might just give her the bounce that she's been seeking in the polls. Then again, the DNC has already changed the rules to allow Mike Bloomberg to join the stage while still excluding Gabbard. Perhaps because they knew that putting Mike Bloomberg on the stage was a quick way to knock him out of the race, and that giving Gabbard a place would not have the same effect. The most likely scenario going forward is that Gabbard will remain a stubborn candidate, unwilling to accept her chances are over until it becomes mathematically impossible for her to win the nomination. It is least likely that she becomes the nominee. It will require both frontrunners to abandon their campaigns, which might be remotely possible given Sanders' heart problems and Biden's memory issues. It's a bit more likely that she would serve as kingmaker by winning just enough delegates to prevent both from winning outright. But only if Sanders takes just a few delegates short of winning and Biden comes in far behind him. Which, given the field, means that Gabbard surges in the polls and gathers several hundred delegates, keeping Sanders at or below 1,900 and Biden at or below 1,400. That's unlikely to happen if she doesn't hit the debate stage, but it could be Sanders' only path to a nomination given the current trends in the polls. Furthermore, she resigned as DNC vice chair specifically to support Sanders in 2016. Permitting her to join the debate would be an act of fairness on his part. Biden, however, he doesn't want Gabbard on that stage. Her debate performances when she was allowed a podium were good enough to have knocked out other candidates and compared to them, a confused old man with a lot of skeletons in his closet is low-hanging fruit. Personally, I'd like to see the party of inclusion let the last minority woman candidate join the old guys just to see what happens. But I have a wicked sense of humor. Now, it's unlikely that she will win the nomination and run in the general election against Donald Trump. And if she does, I won't vote for her. Her policies are just too close to those of Sanders for me to support them. But I personally think that she should be allowed to join the Democratic debates. Let her face the frontrunners and succeed or fail on her own merits. Come on, Tom Perez, let her on the stage. After all the problems which have plagued your caucuses and early debates, your party could use the positive press.